do that. We're still working on that. I apologize. But let's have a jury. standing for the jury. Be seated, please. Uh, witness, if you would face the clerk and be sworn, please. I do. Have a seat, please. Good morning, folks. Thank you for being back here this morning. I hope everybody had a nice weekend. We're, uh, we're resuming with the defense case. This is a witness that had a scheduling problem that we allowed the defense to leave there case open for th this part of the testimony, so we're going to have one defense witness and then one state witness, just so you're not too confused by that, but that's where we stand. You may proceed, Mr. Prince. Good morning, Mr. Knox. If you could please uh, introduce yourself to the jury, spelling your first and last name for the court reporter. Uh, my name is Michael Knox, and that's M-I-C-H-A-E-L-K-N-O-X. And what do you do for a living right now? Uh, I'm a forensic consultant. I do mostly crime scene reconstruction. And can you tell the jury uh, kind of what goes into crime scene reconstruction, what all that involves? Basically, it's the process of <clears throat> evaluating physical evidence in cases to try to come to some conclusions as to what it tells you about how the crime took place, what happened. Okay. And um, can you kind of go over the various types of forensic sciences that are involved in processing and uh, interpreting evidence from a crime scene? Um, it, really, it's a lot of different things. So you, you, you're basically drawing on a lot of information from um, various different aspects of an investigation, whether it's uh, photographs and, and documentation from a crime scene, uh, crime laboratory results from other types of testing done by various different forensic scientists. Um, it, it could be, you know, can, uh, DNA results, looking at uh, uh, firearms examinations, various different kinds of things. And then you're sort of just taking all the pieces and assembling them, them together to get uh, kind of a cogent picture of what took place when a crime occurred. Okay. Um, as, a, as part of your job now, where, wherein you interpret and testify about those different types of forensic sciences. Did you have to go through any specialized education, training, or gather any specialized experience in those fields? Um, yeah, I, I did. I mean, most of it comes through the background of having been in law enforcement for a number of years, as well as education and training that I've gotten along the way. Okay. Let, let's kind of go through each of those and break all that down. I guess tell us first about your educational background. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of North Florida, a master's degree in forensic science from the University of Florida, and then a PhD in criminal justice from uh, Nova Southeastern University. Okay. So it's Dr. Knox at this point, correct? Um, I prefer Mike, but that's, that's <laughs> fine. Okay. Um, and, and tell us as well about your experience. You, you indicated that you've... Uh, you have an extensive history in law enforcement and crime scene processing from that respect. Tell us about that a little. Well, um, I uh, spent about 15 and a half years as a police officer and detective with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. Um, I was uh, for, in uniform for about five and a half years, patrol DUI enforcement, and then I spent seven years as a crime scene investigator and then I spent uh, three years as a traffic homicide investigator. Um, and so during the course of that time, I've been involved in a lot of, of uh, forensic investigations of, of all different types of crimes. I mean, everything from domestic violence cases and burglaries all the way up to homicides, police-involved shootings, things like that. Okay. Um Go through in a little more detail, I guess, if you could, your uh, your experience within crime scene processing. Tell us about the types of evidence that you would be responsible for uh, not only collecting or supervising collection of, but interpreting as well. Well, um, as a crime scene investigator, I would have 
basically dealt with all the physical evidence in, in various different types of crimes. And so that would include things like photographing and, and um, uh, doing other types of documentation, measurements, uh, diagrams, things like that of crime scenes. And then also processing for physical evidence, processing, say, for example, for uh, developing fingerprints on various different items and then recovering those. Um, also collecting DNA samples and getting uh, you know, uh, blood samples, various things like that, documenting footwear impressions, documenting uh, bloodstain patterns, all sorts of things like that that would go into um, the, the physical evidence side of a criminal investigation. Okay, and um, how about your experience as a homicide investigator? What different than you just talked about with respect to your role as a crime scene investigator did you do as a homicide detective? Well, I spent uh, three years in the traffic homicide unit where I did uh, fatal and life-threatening traffic accidents. And, and, and there you, you do some of the physical evidence aspects of it, but then you also get much more deeply into uh, um, what I would call more traditional detective work, doing things like uh, interviewing witnesses and people that are involved in, in various different things, uh, running down leads, um, and, and also looking for... Um, you know, things that might connect somebody. Uh, it could be working, say, a hit-and-run case, and you're looking for evidence that might lead you to who, who it was that was involved in that particular case. So um, there it's sort of a, uh, a, a different type of investigation than you would do as a crime scene investigator. Okay. And I want to ask you um, in more detail about your training and experience as it relates <coughs> to a few different types of topics. So first and foremost, have you, um, have you received specialized training, education, or experience pertaining to, and I know this might overlap a little bit with your uh, work as a crime scene detective, but have you received specialized training education or do you have specialized experience dealing with crime scene processing and have you been qualified as an expert to testify previously on the topic of crime scene processing? Yes, I've, I've been through quite a bit of various different training in uh, uh, different aspects of crime scene investigation. So, you know, including um, the things that I talked about before, doing all the various different processing and, and uh, uh, of physical evidence, fingerprints, footwear impressions, various things like that at crime scenes. <coughs> I've been through training with respect to things like bloodstain pattern analysis and homicide investigations and um, uh, shooting incident reconstruction, things like that. Okay, um, and tell us a little bit about any specialized training and experience you've received uh, relative to firearm forensics. Uh, well, I've been through uh, training courses on uh, shooting incident reconstruction and things like that. Um, and then, of course, uh, I've worked many shooting investigations over the years where I've done, uh, you know, uh, sort of all aspects of shooting reconstruction, including trajectory reconstruction, figuring out where shooters were, uh, looking at, uh, you know, even dealing sometimes with issues related to firearms, whether or not there's a mechanical malfunction to a firearms, all sorts of things like that. Okay. Um, and have you been previously qualified as an expert to testify in court about all of the topics related to firearms that you just discussed? Yes, I have. Okay. And approximately how many occasions? Uh, I, I have probably testified as an expert in at least about 100 cases. Okay. Um, what about wound interpretation? Do you have any specialized training, education, or experience dealing with wound interpretation? Um, I, I do. Um, uh, Training-wise, I've been through, for example, homicide investigations course that dealt heavily with um, Injuries and uh, types of injuries, injury patterns, and things like that. Forensic medicine course that I took as part of my uh, graduate degree in forensic science, and then also um, just you know, uh, pretty extensive experience dealing with injuries and injury patterns. Mostly, what I do as a as a crime scene investigator and crime scene reconstructionist is looking at injury patterns and then comparing that to what's available at a scene to have produce that type of 
injury, the, the shape of it, the, the you know things like that. So, you know, what kind of item could make uh, you know a curved shape injury, or or could make a straight one, or could make a round one, those sorts of things. Uh, yep. So a lot of the injury pattern work that I've done is, is in, in that, in comparing items that are at a crime scene or that, that uh, or could have been at a crime scene and then comparing that to the injury patterns that are, that are present. And have you been previously qualified to testify as an expert on the topic of wound pattern interpretation? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about blood spatter analysis? Tell us about any specialized training, education, or experience you have as it relates to blood spatter analysis. Um, I've actually been through several 40-hour courses on blood stain pattern analysis. So um, generally, there's a, a series of courses. One being what's called a wet workshop, where you basically do a lot of stuff where you create various different types of blood stain patterns, and you see how it's created and, and what happens with that. Then I've been through advanced blood stain uh, pattern analysis, where instead of you creating it or seeing it being created, you come in to stuff that's already there and then have to work with it to try to determine how it got there. And then uh, um, I've also done uh, crime scene reconstruction courses, homicide courses that have dealt with bloodstain patterns and, and um, have done many cases where I've had to do, uh, to one extent or another, analysis of bloodstain patterns. Okay. And d does that include both... Um determination of the directionality or type of blood spatter you're looking at, by which I mean looking at cast off versus impact spatter and which direction it came from, as well as the point of origination and force needed to cause whatever spatter you're looking at? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, and have you previously testified as an expert in the area of blood spatter analysis? I have, yes. Approximately how many times? Um, probably several dozen times. I mean, it, it's... It's usually a topic that comes up in, in most of the cases that I testify in to one extent or another, but probably at least a couple dozen that have been heavily focused on that. Okay. Um, tell me a little bit about your, uh, your teaching experience. Have you, have you had an opportunity to or responsibility to teach other law enforcement officers, agencies, or folks who are going through the process of obtaining degrees on the topics that we've been discussing here, have you had a chance to <coughs> do, do presentations and teach classes on those topics? I have. I actually um, just taught a shooting reconstruction class last week for the Institute of Police Technology and Management in Jacksonville, um, and I teach that class annually for them as well as periodically in other locations. I've taught um, college courses. I've actually taught um, uh, forensic investigations courses at um, Flagler College and at um, Kaiser University, and I've done some other training. I've, I taught a shooting reconstruction course for um, uh, under contract with the U.S. State Department for the uh, uh, police in the Republic of Georgia, um, and also uh, I've taught in Peru and the United Arab Emirates as well. Okay. Can you tell us about any peer-reviewed journal articles or technical papers that you've published or participated in authoring? I've actually um, authored five technical papers related to um, crime scene reconstruction. One was related to traffic accidents, and um, the rest have been related to crime scene reconstruction um, that I uh, presented at various conferences for the... Uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, mostly dealing with some more technical topics related to those subjects. Okay. Um, what about books or contributions to books? Have you authored any books or participated in authoring any books? I, I worked with um, an associate of mine uh, who actually authored a book on crime scene processing, and then we converted it into a multimedia um, training format. So basically... Um, on a DVD where there's, in addition to text, there's a lot of photos and videos and various things that are used for crime scene processing training. Okay. Um, how about uh, how about experience uh, acting as a technical uh, reviewer for other people's crime scene processing and opinions uh, related to crime scene processing? Have you served in that role? 
I have. Um, uh, I've done, uh, particularly when I was in the crime scene unit for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, I was the training coordinator. So I did um, a lot of the, the training as well as doing a lot of review of uh, various different cases. So I, I would get, for example, photos of all the crime scene, the major crime scenes that were worked, and I would go back and review those and then look for any issues, training deficiencies, or anything that needed to be addressed with the other crime scene investigators. Okay. Um, in case I didn't ask it for each specific topic, have you been previously qualified to testify as an expert in court in the areas of crime scene processing and forensics, um, shooting reconstruction and forensics, wound pattern analysis and interpretation, and blood spatter analysis and interpretation? I have, yes. I would tender the witness, Your Honor. Yeah. Mr. Knox, did you have a chance to review crime scene photos from this case? Yes. And based on the crime scene photos that were taken, were you able to do a reconstruction involving and utilizing your knowledge of each of the areas of forensic science that you've been discussing for the past few minutes here? Yes. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. The record reflect on showing the witness was marked for identification as defense composite exhibit. 6A through 6QQQQQ. Uh, Q, 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 Q. That's seven Qs. Can you take a look at that and tell me whether that's a fair and accurate depiction of the pictures you viewed informing your opinions for this case? through 6 Q, 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 uh, as that exhibit for the defense. Any objection? There are. To be admitted. I assume there's some overlap with what's yes. in the evidence. Yes. Yes. Right. Mr. Knox, did you, uh, did you prepare a uh, PowerPoint presentation utilizing those photos to kind of walk the jury through your analysis? Yes. And would referring to that uh, aid you in explaining your analysis to the jury? It would, yes. I would request at this time to publish a demonstrative debate for the jury's use. Can you object to it? All right, you may. <coughs> if I need to figure out a way to make it part of the record, too. Yes, sir. Just, uh, Mr. Would you like me to cut the lights? Or yes, that probably be helpful. Thank you. I guess I can see. Are the monitors working? Did that the, yes. the other day we didn't know the monitors weren't working uh, for a little while, so y'all need to tell us if something's not working. All right, go ahead, Mr. Fred. Thank you, Mr. Knox. Um, we'll start here and just kind of let me know uh, what, if any, relevance you attach to each photograph as we go through, and I'll ask you any follow-ups that I have about that. What are we looking at here with this first slide? So the first slide there is just a um, photograph of the front of the residence at 908 Saddle Creek Run, which is just for orientation purposes so you can see what the house looks like. Okay. So that's the first topic we're going to discuss here is entry and exit points to the house? Yes. Okay. And this photograph actually shows a, uh, it's the master bathroom window which was found unlocked, um, and um, you know this is the condition as it was documented. There's uh, wasn't any processing done in terms of 
collecting any DNA samples or fingerprints or, or anything like that around that particular window. Why is that significant and why is entry and exit point, why are entry and exit points the first things you look at when you start processing a crime scene? Well, entry and exit, obviously, um, you're looking for how does a person get into the residence and then how did they leave the residence. So um, what you're primarily interested in is um, things that would indicate how a person could get, get in and out as well as any evidence that they might have deposited in that process coming in, <coughs> excuse me, as well as going back out again. So you're just looking to see, uh, uh, you know, indicators as far as how they got in and out and, and what evidence they would have brought with them as they came in and what they would have taken out as they left. Okay, so the, the first point of access you looked at, um, this window here, did you say the master bathroom? Master bathroom, that's correct. Okay, it wasn't processed for latents or DNAs? That's that's correct. Based on the documentation that I have, that's correct. Okay. What are we looking at there? Uh, this is just showing a close-up of the, the, the lock on that uh, window and showing that it is it's unlocked. So uh, the, well, the window's closed, it is unlocked, so it could easily be opened. Okay. And, and so what would you do with this if, if you had been processing the scene or supervising processing the scene? Well, primarily, uh, the, the fact that it's unlocked, one is the, the lock mechanism itself in that area that you'd look for, uh, primarily fingerprints or touch DNA evidence. And then secondly is if it appears that that's potentially a location where somebody may have gotten into the residence and or left, then you would want to process basically the whole surrounding area around the window, any place where somebody might have touched coming into or, or out of that window. What are we looking at here? Um, this is showing a, uh, a bathroom window with a torn screen, uh, although it was determined that apparently the torn screen had occurred at a, at a prior occasion. It was not related to this particular incident. Okay. So I guess they would have handled that properly then, taking note of it, documenting it, and then doing some additional investigation to determine whether that was relevant to the case. That's correct. That's you. Would, you would want to consider it, but obviously, once the there's an explanation as to the the, uh, the screen, if you've determined that that's not the window that was used to access the residence for the uh, for this particular case, then then uh, just documenting it would be sufficient. Was there any uh, was there any processing done um, when the, when the scene was processed on the outside of this window right here? I the the documentation that I had didn't show that there was any processing done. So um, just photographs to document it. What's next here? Uh, this is the back door to the residence and um, you can see the photograph on the right showing it, it, the uh, deadbolt uh, which was unlocked. Um, however the doorknob below that was locked and then the broader photograph on the left shows that there's that red uh, curtain there, and uh, we'll see in the next photograph that there's actually a blood stain on that red curtain. What is this? A close up of the red curtain we were just discussing? It is. It's a close up of the red curtain, and it shows where there's a blood stain, uh, you, which you can see actually right here just to the left of this uh, ruler that's attached right there. And um, uh, there's not any evidence of any type of blood enhancement or anything having been done uh, there. So, you know, again, where you do see that you have some type of blood, then you would be considering not only the potential of any fingerprints or DNA evidence in that area, but also the potential for um, enhancement of that blood to see what else could be there. Um, with blood, you have certain amounts that you may see visibly, but there could be additional blood that you don't see, and there are certain chemicals you can use to enhance that and, uh, and, and other techniques that you can use to try to enhance it and see if there's additional blood there that's not readily visible. Would that include, like, a loop of crystal violet that was used around the front door, around the speeder body? Potentially, yes, that, luminol. There's some, some other different types of chemicals, as well as using just using an alternate light source that helps to bring contrast between blood and any background materials behind it. Um, tell us a little more about that before we go on to the next slide. What is, uh, 
what does it mean to use an alternative light source and how does that assist in processing the crime scene? Basically what an alternate light source is, is um, it's a light unit that allows you to control the color of the light. So um, depending on what type of unit we're talking about, you can be anything from specialized flashlights that have colored lenses on them all the way up to um, some very expensive units that, that use a, a very bright lamp and have the ability to tune and control the color of the light output. What happens with blood in particular is that um, at certain wavelengths or certain colors of light, blood absorbs light and gets much darker. And so um, you can often get better contrast between the blood and whatever material that it's on by darkening the color of the blood so that, that it stands out more and you're able to, to see it better, photograph it better, and, and uh, get a better idea of what's there, what type of pattern you're looking at, things like that. We're moving into the uh, master bedroom now, is that correct? That's correct, yes. What, what did you look at first here when uh, reviewing the photographs of Miss Peter's bedroom? Well, this, uh, this photograph just shows kind of the general state of the, the bedroom, and you can see that um, you have a number of different items that are out of place, things that, you know, bedding that's uh, shifted off the bed, you have items on the floor, you have various uh, different things that it, it, it could be consistent with, um, you know, some type of struggle or something taking place in the bedroom. You know, obviously when you look at items that are out of place, then you, know, you have to give consideration to that people keep their houses in different conditions. Some people's houses, this would be extremely out of place. Some people, it might be, you know, a little bit more common. But the fact that you have items out of place here then will tie into some of the other evidence that is present in the room. What are you taking note of right there? Uh, there, the, uh, there's an area it's circled and, and denoted up there of transfer stains. That's some, some blood stains that were present on the mattress. And then also um, over in that uh, right-hand corner, you see... Uh, a telephone, it's on the floor, the handset is off the, the uh, cradle, and the telephone cord has been actually both cut and torn. So it's, it's actually got a, a portion of it that's been cut, and then there's a portion of it that's actually been torn out of the wall. Okay. And so these are what you would look at as uh, at least initial clues that the struggle started or took place here? Right, because you, the, the biggest things that you look at here is one, obviously, you know, a phone cord that's cut or torn is typically unusual for most people. Uh, and then certainly the presence of blood begins to tell you that some type of violence or some event has taken place. And what we'll kind of see as we walk through this is that you have a small amount of blood present in this room and then an increasing amount as we move away from this room and then eventually move toward the front of the house and in the uh, foyer area. Is this a close-up of the, uh, the blood spatter on the bed? Yes, and there are actually several uh, drops of blood. You can see uh, this area here, right here, right up here, as well as right here um, that you have. Um, some blood stains that are potentially either uh, of some type of transfer or some type of spatter stains. Okay. Um, any conclusions to be drawn based on the characteristics of these uh, of this spatter pattern? It, it's difficult to say much about the characteristics as to whether it's uh, from a spatter event or from some type of transfer. The, the, the primary conclusion you can draw from this is that we have a very small amount of blood starting in this area. And so, as I said, as, as you move to other parts of the house, then there'll be increasing amounts, which indicates that, um, you, you know, clearly the injuries that Brandy Peters suffered did not happen all here, but that she had uh, likely some injury that occurred in this room um, or at least that she was in this room after having suffered some amount of injury where there's a small amount of blood, um, and then that's going to increase as you get to, to the front of the house. What are we looking at here? Uh, and this is just showing a little closer view of the telephone itself 
and um, you can note that you actually have um, a break in the cord here and then um, the, this phone jack itself is actually torn from the wall there. This is the close up of the sign? It is. This is just showing a little closer. You can see the break in the cord. You can see how the cord here is uh, torn and pulled loose. Are the, do you consider those as you're going through the process of uh, doing a forensic evaluation of um, the evidence on scene? Do you, do you, would you generally consider that evidence of a struggle? It, it certainly it goes along with a struggle. And so when, when, you, when you couple that with the fact that you have the, the blood have been beginning to appear here in this room, you have the, the phone cord, um, and then there's some other evidence that we'll see here in the room that, it, that it indicates that, that there is some struggle taking place in this room. Now, what, what are these marks that we're looking at here next to the phone cord and the phone cradle? There's some black scuff marks, so actually on the wall in the area of the phone jack, so the, the phone would have been plugged into the wall here, and then there's some black scuff marks along the wall in these areas. And what did you find those to be consistent with? Well, uh, you know, black scuff would mean that obviously something of some type of similar material rubbed against the wall. That, that can come from a number of different things. It could come, you know, say, from a portion of somebody's shoes. It could come from other uh, types of uh, articles of clothing. It could be something else that has that, uh, um, typically like a rubbery, uh, but it's some type of a black substance that would transfer to the wall. So, so it's, what you're looking at there are some type of scuffs that indicate something brushed against the wall that had that coloration to it and transferred some of it to the wall. Um, beyond photographing the scuff marks, was any analysis beyond that performed, by which I mean, did they take, uh, you know, cutting out of the drywall, or did they um, take a scraping of the material to, to try and determine what its originating source may have been? The documentation that I have indicated that they cut it out, but there was no indication that it was ever submitted for any type of comparison or testing. What are we looking at here? This is the uh, exterior side of the master bathroom door. So the carpeted portion here would be the master bedroom area. And then this leading into the master bathroom. And then you can see uh, circled here in yellow is another black scuff mark that's on the bottom of that door. So this is leading from Brandy's bedroom into her bathroom, not the common bathroom where the children were found? That's correct. This would be the... the master bathroom where uh, in her bedroom so we have another scuff mark another black scuff mark on the door leading into that bathroom that's correct was this one sampled um again i i, I actually i'm not even certain whether it was collected or not but there was no indication that it was ever compared to anything okay. this is a close-up of the same yes You have that marked as residue. What, what does that mean? Uh, you, you can see, again, you have the black scuff mark, but then there's a, uh, a heavier concentration, some, some portions of residue from whatever the material was that cre created the black scuff mark. So if you were supervising the processing of the scene, what, if anything, would, would you have done with that residue? Well, I think you know, the first thing you would do is obviously collect it. So. You could do that either by taking sampling, samples of it, scraping it, or uh, actually cutting it out, taking either the whole door or cutting a portion of the door off the bottom and, and, and submitting it that way. And then the follow-up to that is that that would need to be submitted for laboratory analysis that you can do basically two things. One would be, as it stands, you could run it to see what the chemistry of it is, figure out what, what kind of material is it. And two would be if you had a similar material found somewhere, then you could make a comparison to see if it's the same chemistry as uh, as what's there on the the, uh, the marks. So in a vacuum, say if you developed a, a, a suspect and were able to execute a search warrant and, and gather various item, items from his home, you could compare those items to the material determined to have caused these scuff marks? Yes. Okay. What is this a picture of? Uh, this is 
again, uh, kind of an overall view showing the bedroom and the, the door here in the background is the uh, master uh, bathroom area. And one thing to note in the room here is that Brandy Peters' purse is on the floor right here at the uh, foot of the bed or next to the bed. Okay. Well, why did you take note of that? Um, it, the, the purse, as you can see it, I mean, it's on the floor. It appears to be turned over, um, which, again, taken in context with the rest of what's shown in the room is indication of likely some type of struggle taking place. It's, it's not a normal location for a purse. And again, it is sort of overturned. It's not sitting nicely in a particular area. So that indicates that it's, it may well have been um, knocked over, turned over, or thrown on the ground in some fashion during uh, a struggle taking place here. Right. Next, you've uh, taken note of a, uh, of a projectile hole in the closet door. Looks like outside the bedroom. Is that right? That's correct. So. Um, there's actually a bullet hole right here that's in a um, uh, closet door there. Okay. What's this a picture of? Uh, this is showing that same bullet hole, and so what you're, what you're actually looking at here is a closet in the hallway, and then um, you have these two doors on either, either side are to the children's bedrooms. So wh where would uh, Brandy Peter's bedroom be in relation to this bullet hole right here? It would be across the hall. So the open door to her bedroom would be kind of looking out across the hall to with the closet door sort of being centered and then um, you can partially see the bedroom doors from her or one of the bedroom doors from her room. So this is a, uh, a different angle of the same shot we were looking at a second ago? That's correct. All right, what are we looking at here? This is um, showing a trajectory rod that was placed through the hole um, and into the door, and then inside you can see a placard where the bullet was recovered from inside. Uh, why are trajectory rods used, and why is trajectory calculated when you're processing a crime scene if the evidence is available to do so? Well, what uh, what the trajectories allow you to do is, is so for example, here you have a, a, a bullet that has passed through a door. Is you can determine the angle that it was traveling when it struck the door, and through using a trajectory rod and some other techniques, you can bring that back to figure out. Um, where a shooter could have been and where they could not have been. So what you're looking at in particular is where does it come back to? For example, does that come back to the interior of Brandy Peters' bedroom or would her bedroom be excluded? Would it have to have occurred outside of the bedroom? <coughs> also, you can look at things like if it does go into her bedroom, uh, does the height of it, so you have an, an angle to this particular shot. At some point, as you move it back further and further, it's going to get higher and higher off the ground. And at some point, that would get to a point where it's too high for somebody to have fired it. So you can use that to hopefully narrow down the area where the person was when they fired the shot. I suppose it's implicit in your testimony. Uh, but what you're saying, basically, is that this bullet had a downward trajectory. And so as you get farther away from it, it's going to go higher and higher up. That's correct. As you back away from this closet door, then, then it's going to be higher and higher off the ground. So at some point, it would get too high for anybody to have fired the shot, or you know, um, certainly if you had some information about who fired the shot. Um, and, and so what you would want to do with it is figure out where could that person have been. Uh, but again, just sort of using that to locate and help figure out where somebody was when they fired the shot. Based on the trajectory of that particular projectile, were you able to determine generally where the shot would have been fired from? It, it's a little bit difficult with this documentation, primarily because <coughs> <coughs> what was done here is trajectory rod was placed in the door, some photographs were taken of it, but there's additional information that I would normally use. If, if I worked the scene, I would actually uh, get angles and you know do certain distance uh, distance measurements and calculations and things like that and I could 
um, work it back and figure out where it could be. The other issue here, too, is that, um, like in this particular photograph, you can see that the closet door is partially open as the trajectory rod is photographed, but the uh, prior photograph that we saw, the closet door was almost completely closed. So there's some question there as to what position was the door in at the time of the shot. Was it open, closed, fully closed, partially closed? Um, and, and those things would be um, something that if you could determine that, then, then you can get very accurate. If you can't determine it, then, then obviously if the door was in different positions, that would affect the location of where the shooter would have to be. Position of the door at the time the shot was fired, would you be able to determine the left handedness or right handedness of a potential shooter uh, or not based on the ability to move and reposition your body? Not really. Um, there, there, are, there are very few things in, in crime scene work where you can really get a handle on what hand a person used simply because, for example, with a gun, I, I could be holding a gun with this hand. I could put this hand up and hold it with the same hand. The gun itself hasn't changed position. It's still in the same location, and so the trajectory doesn't change. So you really can't determine which way a person held the gun, whether they used two hands, one hand, right, left, any of those sorts of things. What you can tell would just be uh, information about uh, where it could have originated from and then and, um, where it traveled before getting to the closet. What's this next photo up? Uh, this is just showing that that placard number 17 here in the middle of the closet is um, where the bullet itself was recovered. And that's a close-up of the projectile? Yes, that's actually showing where it was found uh, inside the closet. What is this we're looking at? Um, that's some three-dimensional diagramming that was done by um, Tallahassee police with respect to some of the trajectories that they were able to determine. So um, that one, the, the shot that we were just looking at, I believe would be this green line right here, is what, what they determine and what they've documented with the 3D. According to what they've documented here, the shot that, that, that ended up in the closet, the projectile that just ended up in the closet, would have been fired from inside Ms. Peter's bedroom? Right, and that's that's what, um, uh, it, without having, uh, assuming anything with respect to the door, if we just assume that the, the closet door is either closed or nearly closed when it happens, then the trajectory certainly would, would go across the hall and toward the bedroom uh, and and could would have been potentially fired from just about anywhere along that line inside the bedroom. Okay. Um, we see a, a red and a purple line there as well. What did those indicate? There were actually a couple of other bullet strikes uh, that were documented. We'll see those in some of the subsequent photographs. Um, those are the, the one that went out the window and the two that ended up in the master bedroom toilet room? That's correct. Did those shots also originate from within the master bedroom? It would appear so, yes. What are we looking at there? There's a silver bracelet on the floor that's in, uh, inside where that yellow circle is. And, and what are we looking at here? The hallway, we're looking from the hallway into Ms. Peter's bedroom? That's correct, yes. And, and why did you take note of the, uh, the bracelet located on the floor right there? Again, uh, you know, an unusual location for it. It would appear to have been dropped there uh, in some fashion. Um, given that it's, uh, you know, other evidence that's present around there of a struggle, then that would indicate that there's a, a uh, uh, at least the possibility that that was deposited there during the course of the struggle. What is this one here? Uh, this is a close-up view of that bracelet. Um, if you were directing or, or supervising the uh, processing of this crime scene, what would you have liked to see done with this bracelet? Well, 
obviously documenting it, but then uh, collecting it and processing it for um, primarily for DNA evidence to see if you can determine who the wearer may have been or anybody who may have touched it. Um, and of course, another thing that you'd want to do with it is identify whose who's it is, if you can identify it as belonging to either Brandy Peters or potentially somebody else, because um, when you find something like that, the, the obvious source would be that it was Brandy Peters, but you don't know that. If you don't confirm it, you wouldn't know for certain that in fact that's hers and it's not deposited there by somebody else. So um, that would be the main thing is, is once you collect it, then to uh, consider DNA examination of it as well as identifying who it belongs to. Was, uh, was the bracelet itself or a swab of the bracelet sent off for DNA analysis in this case? Not based on any of the um, um, documentation that I have. It indicates that it, there was nothing done in terms of DNA examination on that bracelet. What are we looking at here? Uh, that is showing a uh, another bullet impact. There's actually a trajectory rod right there in the circle, and a, that's a bullet that uh, passed through the window from inside the room to the outside. Okay, and, and I guess since uh, the trajectory rod seems to be pointing down to the bedroom, that would indicate a slightly upward trajectory for the bullet? That's right. So it would, would have been fired from... A location likely lower than where it is there in the window from somewhere inside the room. And again, can any determination uh, about the right handedness or left handedness of the shooter be determined based on the tra trajectory or suspected point of origin? No. No. What are we looking at there? This is the um, from. Uh, the master bedroom, which is the carpeted area, going into the master bathroom. So the master bathroom door. And then this right here is, um, a, a separate, uh, some people might refer to it as a toilet closet where basically the, the toilet has its own separate door in front of it. And the yellow circle is showing another trajectory rod where a bullet impacted and actually perforated that door. Uh, based on the trajectory and suspected point of origin of that shot, can any determination be made about the right-handedness or left-handedness of the shooter? No. Is this a close-up of the same? It is. How about this one? Um, this is a uh, bullet impact on the uh, metal frame of the, the glass shower doors. So you have the kind of the shower door over here, and then you have another glass panel on this side, and then right here is where there's a bullet impact onto that metal frame. This is a, this is a shot of the master bedroom, showing where the two projectiles were located? The master bathroom, yes, that's right. There's a bullet that was found over here and a bullet that was found inside there. That one on the left is the... Uh, toilet closet you were just discussing? Yes. <coughs> um, based on the location of the projectiles and the trajectories of the two projectiles, uh, did both of those shots originate from the master bedroom? It would appear so. The, the, um, the one in the door going into the, uh, the toilet closet area is uh, actually perforated the door and so they put a trajectory rod in it and that points back into the bedroom area. The impact to the uh, metal door, you can't really put a trajectory rod on, but it is in a location where it could have been fired from the bedroom. Um, so um, certainly nothing that would eliminate the bedroom as being the, the location where it was fired from. What are we looking at right here? Here is... Um, a blood transfer stain, just denoted by the yellow circle, on the door frame. And that's the door coming from the master uh, bedroom out into the hallway. Okay. Can you uh, make any 
determination about the directionality of the swipe? It uh, appears to be coming outward. So when you, when you get uh, what's called a blood swipe, where you have an object with blood on it that rubs across the surface, you sort of get feathering of the edges of it, which indicates the direction that it was going. And so what's indicated here is that this is uh, a blood stain coming out of the bedroom toward the hallway. <clears throat> what, if any significance do you attach to the directional blood swipe leaving the master bedroom? Well, primarily, we, you have in the bedroom, you have some evidence of blood. We saw some blood on the bed. You have evidence of gunfire. Um, Brandy Peters actually has on her uh, left uh, shoulder area, a gunshot wound, and um, so what that would tend to indicate is that there's some struggle that took place in the bedroom, some gunfire that's taken place in the bedroom, she suffered at least some injury in the bedroom, and then has fled from the bedroom and headed uh, out into the hallway, and, then, and there's some blood stains that, that denote going from the hallway and continuing towards the front of the house. Is this a close-up of the same shot? Yes. Um, and so I guess explain to the jury here what you look at when you make a determination about the direction of this blood swipe. Um, you're looking at uh, certain things like the feathering of the, the, the uh, uh, blood stain patterns and the way that it comes off the edges. Uh, see, for example, here you have a molding profile, and the edge, the front edges of it are clean, and so that means that your blood source is rubbing off right. of this way. Stop and point, Mr. Prince. We need to take the morning. Right. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Nash. We'll finish this slide and then take a break. All right, and and so then uh, you know those various indicators again, same thing here. You have a clean front edge of the door, uh, so indicating that you have blood coming from this end and this way moving outward, coming from the bedroom out toward the hall. Okay. And um, you mentioned that Brandy Peters had a gunshot wound to her left shoulder. Um, is, is the uh, direction and location of this blood sweat consistent with the blood from that, that first projectile wound having uh, caused, caused blood to be deposited on and around her arm? Is that consistent with the height of this uh, blood sweat pattern right here? It, it is, appears to be, yes. We'll take a break. Right. All right. We'll take 15 minutes. Either side, anything. There you are. All right. We'll be <clears throat>